start this now. All right, well, we're glad to have everyone here. Um, we've been kind of planning this event for months now, and uh, this actually started off, it's, it's kind of a fun story. Uh, it actually started off Rajat, who's with us right now. He had uh, reached out to me on LinkedIn. I never met him, didn't know anything about him. And uh, at first, my initial thought was, this is just one of those cold call, like, you know, sales messages that I was getting. Um, and I was like, mostly thinking I'm not interested. And then I saw a little bit about what they did. And I was like, okay, I might not be a buyer, but I'm kind of curious, like, what is this company? What do you actually do? So I was like, all right, sure. And uh, so he and I messaged a little bit. We set up a time to, to talk just like this. And as he started explaining about Ubrix and what they did, I asked a lot of questions uh, and he had lots of answers. And we just had a really great conversation and we talked for quite a while and then said, hey, let's set up more time. And so we talked a few times, ended up uh, connecting with, with Nikita here uh, that you all hear from soon. And um, we just had a number of conversations, spent a lot of time just learning about what they were as a business and then started to kind of come back and share with the ODNLA leadership, uh, hey, here's this company, they're doing something really interesting. We've been looking at this stuff related to AI. This is taking it from a very different perspective. And we haven't really ever hosted you know, a startup company, much less an international one. And so this will be something really unique for us. And it just, it kind of made sense. And so that's kind of how we end up getting to where we're at now. Um, and so we've got a lot we're gonna cover tonight. It's gonna be very kind of conversational between myself and Nikita. She's got some stuff she's gonna share. Um, and hopefully just, yeah, uh, make this very opening, uh, eye-opening for everyone. At the end, we'll have time for Q&A, certainly. And if you've got questions, you can put those in the chat. We'll be able to monitor those. But also, following the official event, uh, we'll take a short break, and then we'll have an optional like extra half hour for networking. And so if people have more questions, and they still want to know other things, uh, Nikita has already offered to, to stay on and help answer some of those questions. And I'm sure they would love to connect with people beyond this if you had even more questions or interest. And so uh, certainly we want to make this very accessible and, and very interactive uh, for folks. So uh, that's that. And a few announcements about us with ODNLA. We do have some different events that are being planned. Not all of them are posted up on our meetup site yet. But one thing we do have is our growth huddle, which is a new program. It's essentially kind of intended as a more or less peer support um, sort of program where people can get together and there'll be a general structure, but it's largely for people to just kind of talk with each other. What sort of things are they working on? What challenges do they have? Maybe there's an area that you're interested in, in knowing about, like a certain sub-discipline within OD, and people can just kind of fairly informally discuss those things and, and kind of learn from one another uh, in a very kind of casual, supportive environment. So those are starting up uh, Friday, September 12th, Friday, September 6th, and those will run at noon. Um, and they'll be hosted by Sandy Mills, Dr. Sandy Mills, our other um, co-chair for ODNLA. We also have our pro bono committee, which they've earlier this year finished their first project where they were doing a, a free of service, a pro bono project for a nonprofit. And they're now kind of starting to look at what their next venture might be uh, with all of that. So if that's something of interest, certainly reach out, let us know, we can get you connected. Sandy's also helping uh, to lead that effort. One other uh, announcement we have, and this literally just happened uh, a week ago, uh, and it's been an ongoing conversation for years about whether ODNLA should keep the name ODNLA, uh, should it be something different? Uh, the meetup platform, is that the right place for us to kind of run? And uh, we decide we're gonna actually have a name change and we're gonna be shifting off of meetup onto a whole different setup. We have a lot more information that'll be coming on that, but we've already started the work on making all those changes uh, and we'll have lots of communications and we're hoping that this is gonna make uh, a much better experience for, for everyone. So we're really excited for that. All right. Now, uh, now that we have all of that out of the way, um, our guest tonight 
Uh, our main guest tonight is Nikita James. She's the CEO of Ubrix. And she spent about 10 years doing HR consulting work before starting Ubrix. She's uh, spent time working with Ernst & Young, PricewaterhouseCoopers, Corn Ferry in, in consulting roles. Uh, she's also got uh, degrees in engineering and an MBA from the Management Development Institute. So she certainly knows her way around. She understands HR. She understands consulting. She's bringing that all together uh, with her team, with Maxim D'Souza, who's here with us. He is their chief technology officer. We also have Rajat um, on their sales team that I met. And one fun fact about Rajat, because I I'd asked this, this is one of the main things that came up in our conversations. Uh, he is not just a salesperson. We got to talking, it turned out this guy's a full blown engineer. Um, and I was like, what? Okay. Uh, so everyone in India is like an engineer or a doctor or something. Um, <laughs> even their salespeople are, are engineers. Um, so it was really impressive, but it also just spoke to the, the level of qualifications and how serious they are about doing this sort of thing. Uh, and so we're really excited to have them here with us. And so Dakita, welcome uh, to ODN LA. Welcome to our event tonight. We're glad Thank to you so you. much. Thank you. Lovely uh, to see you all here. Yeah. Um, and we're going to get some more time to learn more about Nikita's background and Hubert's background. Uh, what we wanted to start off with, actually, is just really kind of high level, big picture, understanding what Hubert is and is not. Um, and first and foremost, in the space of human resources. So, uh, Nikita, there's already a lot of HR technology solutions and things like that. Why would you say that we need something new? Uh, what's wrong with all the things that already exist? Like, where does Ubrix come in? Uh, and what's what kind of the main case for, for why something like Ubrix needs to exist? Perfect, yes. Uh, thank you for asking that question, Tony. And uh, really delighted to see everyone. And starting with that, uh, I would I, I definitely would like to answer that in parts. I would present my screen as well so that you all can see a few things. Uh, just give me a moment. Is it visible? Is my screen visible? Yes. All right, perfect. So uh, yes, thank you for that question. Uh, I would say that yes, there are a lot of tools in the market and we are uh, ourselves as talent intelligence platform that then we already have like so many tools in assessments, in development, in analytics. So what exactly is something that we are trying to solve? Um, just to give you like a brief background about uh, what I observed as a consultant in last 10 years is that uh, despite all these tools being there, uh, there are four big issues that we uh, heard our clients from across the globe uh, in India, in the UK, in US and many other places talking about, which is that all these tools are, uh, you know, disintegrated, they are in different places, and it's very difficult to combine them to get the most of them and bring an integrated view. That's a very big problem uh, when you look at industry and when they solve very specific problems, but not bringing it all together for large enterprises. The second big issue that we heard people talk about is ROI. So you talk to any learning, any OD, and they would first uh, tell you that, hey, can your tool give me some ROI? And the problem is that it's not just they are not getting ROI, it's that they don't know how to define ROI. What is ROI? If they are doing a journey, if they are planning for some talent program, uh, apart from attendance, what else can they get out of it is something that they're not sure. They, they don't know the definition of ROI. And uh, the third and the most important piece that as all of us, uh, OD practitioners, LND practitioners are struggling with is that how do we create the last mile impact? Uh, it's very easy, right? To connect with coaches uh, for leaders, for top levels. We can give them the best coaches, the best people to train them to, uh, uh, you know, to build their competencies. But when it comes to the middle and the lower layers of hierarchy, where we have thousands of people, it's impossible to scale OD. It's impossible to bring it to everybody's life. And therefore, it continues to be non-democratic. 
non accessible so despite knowing the problem we are not able to as practitioners really find a solution in our services so that's where uh, we we realized as founders three years back that this is a very big opportunity if we can solve these three fundamental problems and use technology to do that because of course the human way we won't be able to scale then that's where uh, really we can solve the fundamental issues associated with od and therefore uh, what we created or why ubrix is exactly what we started answering for our customers for industry that we are going to promise you a definition defined timed and measurable roi so uh, what that means etc we'll dive into but are we seeing some needle movements on performance of an individual of business of capability that they carry are we seeing a measurable tangible movement from our programs that's measurable roi we are going to deliver second we are going to build deep organizational context into these programs so sometimes these programs could be generic and therefore they don't deliver the roi the value that is expected so can we bring ai very intelligently with lots and lots of data uh to really bring organizational context how that organization is structured what kind of roles what kind of culture how they perform uh what they believe will help them perform so all that deep context that lies in the years and decades of their existence is something that their programs need to replay to ne need to understand and therefore can ai help us with that uh the third of course application is that how do we not just reach and access everybody in the organization till the last mile but we use ai to create personalized support system support coaching for every individual till the last level uh and finally bringing all of this together in form of intelligence and data that can continuously evolve over a period of time and help organization as and when their priorities shift or evolve with time so that's that's how we differentiate ourselves excellent um so maybe we can kind of dive in a little bit about ubrix as a company here so first of all when was it started so we started in 2021 okay. and uh, sometime around june Okay. So yeah, still fairly young. Um and startup can mean a lot of things from, you know, pre-revenue that you haven't made a, a single dollar to, you know, making several millions of dollars and and lots of things in between. So, um about how many clients does Ubrix have right now? So right, right now we have around 35 uh, large scale enterprises and a lot of other startups and mid-sized companies. and we take deep pride in uh, working with companies like apple pwc gulf oil uh, royal enfield and lot of global brands so yes our strategy is to really solve the problem where it hurts the most which is large enterprises and therefore that was our starting point and in our journey uh, we started acquiring startups and mid sized companies and realized that od should critic we were reminded of principle that it should democratic democratic and it should be given to everybody and therefore we realized the power of od even for the smaller and mid sized companies not for profit companies and so on and so forth excellent thank you um and so of those clients that you've had uh, about how many of those tend to retain with you you know once they've signed on and they they've started to kind of work with you how, how many of those are you actually keeping Oh yeah so that's that's something that's very close to uh, us as founders as a question because we have 100% retention in fact we have grown our accounts by 50% year on year so people have started finding very interesting applications of od of uh, competencies across organizations that why do we just do programs why don't we just in, uh, implement values and culture across the whole organization and take it till the last mile so those kind of you know new use cases are coming up and we are increasing our uh, uh, account size every year awesome um 
You know, and that certainly kind of gives some indication because one of the questions that, you know, some of the questions people have about AI is, um, you know, in, around proof of concept, uh, will companies actually use this? Will they stick with it or will it just kind of be a new thing and then kind of fade away? And, and are they seeing any sort of real impact or is it is it more novelty? And it sounds like with 100% retention rate, it certainly sounds like these companies, and we're not just talking small little companies, you're talking about these big global brands, they're seeing value in it and they're choosing to stay with you. Uh, so they're certainly seeing some, some value and impact on it. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that uh, here in just a moment. And so are you able to speak to, um, you know, with the clients you work with, the accuracy of the product and how well it does its work for the clients? Yes, so our uh, methods are quite uh, focused and data centric. So what we do is that uh, generally for us, the first step of any launch would be that we define specific metrics and uh, relevance of AI across the organization. So it's called our user acceptance testing setup, uh, which, can, uh, which includes most of the users, employees from different segments of an organization. So if there is a large organization with say, I don't know, maybe a hundred departments, one person from every department, uh, we, will go, we will make them go through some testing instances. They will experience AI, its recommendations. There's a coach bot. So they try to interact with the bot and these different personalities and personas really validate the uh, relevance for them, for their industry, for their role. And this has come up to around 97% accuracy, which means that for every 100 roles that we administer, 97 give us a thumbs up that, and they do it for a month before they launch. And then during the launch as well, when we are looking at regular feedback mechanism, uh, every week, every month, we see very high coherence and very high validation in terms of around 97 to 98% uh, being super job and industry specific insight that they're able to get. Okay. So what you're saying is that when this gets deployed with a client organization, you're kind of mapping competencies, you're, you're mapping job descriptions, kind of figuring out all this information and then yeah. The system will help create what are these specific things that they can do to help them improve in those areas. And that That's out of that, for a typical organization, that 97, 98% are saying yeah. this is highly relevant and specific to me and where I'm at. Yes, that's right. That's Which right. is pretty impressive um, that you can have that level of accuracy and relevancy. Um, and that that can be, like you mentioned, scale across the organization because um, a lot of the work that tends to happen on the OD side generally is really kind of focused at the leadership level and then we just kind of work and say all right we're going to talk to them about cascading that down and here's what that should be but it's you know in many cases here's the template here's the tools on how to do that with your team and it sounds like you're able to use the technology to like even help remove some of those needs for the manager uh, to kind of help empower them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. Um, so now when, when we think about, you know, working with a, a technology company, something that's doing something really new and innovative, what is the typical client profile? Like meaning when you're saying uh, someone's interested in working with us or we're interested in working with this organization, what things do they need to check off that say that they're a good candidate to really work with you all as a company? So I think, uh, again, Tony, uh, we try to, uh, we are trying to expand it across sizes, but I would say that so far our ideal customer fit has been companies which have at least 100 people or more. And that's purely from the scale perspective that we want to validate that if we are not just going to some handful of people, but going in more complex setups where there are established practices, established tools, technologies already there, and there is a fairly uh, decent sample size, which we can say that at least 100 people, that gets us the room to really solve the problem of 
uh, bringing personalization at scale, bringing uh, that optimization data power at scale. And therefore that becomes our ideal customer fit. And those companies are struggling right now the most, and therefore they need a solution the most. Uh, so between 100 and, and going above from 100 is more like, you know, as you scale up, as you become 10,000 people company, 50,000 employees company, that count increases and compounds the problem. So from there, we become even more fitter as a, as a product fit. But I would like to bring out that there is a threshold of minimum 100 people that we look at to really start working with the company. Okay. And does it matter in terms of, you know, technology capabilities that they have, uh, you know, financial ability? Because, I, I mean, obviously, it's got to cost them something, you know, so there's got to be a certain, I would imagine mm -hmm. that's also so, part of the number. Yeah. So, uh, actually, in terms of technology, uh, they could be at any level. In fact, a lot of our clients are at a very primitive level when it comes to technology. They don't even have basic uh, HR systems or not even like basic organizational wide ERPs. And yet Ubrix is like a simple plugin. The way today you use Udemy and you don't really have to be tech savvy to use Udemy. You can just go on the on its side, log in and you can start or maybe LinkedIn, LinkedIn learning. So these are the platforms that are created for UI and UX first. And uh, therefore they are easy to use. So from user standpoint, we have created it that way. And from organizational standpoint, we try to use whatever data formats they are giving us more unstructured, uh, different formats, you know, they could be pictures, they could be documents. So they don't have it organized in say some system, some technology uh, portal, they can give us unstructured data and all Ubrix needs is just feed it into its engines and start working for them. Okay. Uh, now you were earlier, you were talking about ROI, uh, you know, particularly that for a lot of folks who work in OD, it's a challenge to one, define that, but then two, also, how do you actually do that in an organization, especially with the learning side of things? Um, other areas, there might be a little bit easier to quantify that, but on the learning side, it may be more challenging. Uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm curious, because I'm sure others are as well, how do you uh, actually demonstrate ROI through these sort of learning activities that people are doing. Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, the answer to the conceptual process uh, lies in your question, which is that um, by making people not just learn, but really act upon those learnings is something that we believe is the fundamental way to bring any change, any impact on the ground, right? And that's what ROI is. Then it's more about what are we measuring? How are, what metrics are important for business? But the fundamental problem why learning platforms today or programs are not able to prove ROI is because they can provide a lot of inputs to people in form of, you know, uh, courses, in form of classrooms and so on and so forth. But they cannot guarantee or they cannot empower, enable people to act on those learnings, to act on those inputs on a daily basis. And when people don't act on things, they don't, their performance doesn't change. So we are basically a nudging and an action platform. So I'll just take you through the process because it's very important for you to understand how our ROI deli gets delivered. So uh, our first step is, of course, to map an organization, pick up all their data, understand what are the roles, what are the skills required, and what are the right ideal profiles for every role and every individual in an organization that will bring them to better performance or what performance level is expected from them, what kind of skills are needed for that. So we first connect job performance to skills. We, we map that uh, from job descriptions, from job analysis, and so on and so forth. And we say that, okay, these are five or eight skills that you require to really perform well. Then we do gap assessment to understand which parameters or which skills are really derailing their performance on the ground. And then we fix it using personalized pathways, which have nudges and actions. So we not just provide them theoretical inputs like videos and stuff like that, but we actually give them some activity every day. They have to perform task and uh, really apply that job 
and week on week we see if you know we are getting outcome in terms of manager feedback that's a very important first roi component for us that our managers feeling that week on week their team member is performing better on certain goals parameters second uh, we integrate with a lot of tools inside an organization like customer relationship management your crms your uh, project management tools for engineers for sales force and we try to see that over a period of time when we are administering these interventions these activities is it changing their performance level are they getting better sales are they getting better uh, uh, quicker timelines more efficient outcomes all those metrics are changing in the business mis systems if those exist then we try to create a correlation and the third one we do is that we regularly almost on a weekly basis do a skill check through quizzes cases that are created by ai ai also does role plays with them to understand how much have they moved in terms of their skill level and that's called a skill score change so every week we try to project that if you were 3 on 5 have you become 3.1 3.2 3.3 so that's how manager feedback business impact metrics uh, from different systems and uh, skill score change these are our three core metrics that help us prove very definitively from all parts of organization the roi Okay, this is great because it actually leads into the next portion, which is really, you know, if I'm going to be, if I'm a company that wants to work with you, what sorts of things can I do to prepare that are going to help me really get the absolute most out of this? What are your best client? What are your best clients doing to get started right? Yeah, yeah, perfect. So uh, I think the first thing that we help our uh, best of the clients, if we look at what are we helping them do, is that first let's help, let's articulate and organize their data. So how do we get some of the? Uh, if you look at this slide, right? So how do we get to some of their uh, documents, whatever formats of roles of skills? Uh, what are the expected business priorities? These are few data points that we require. to get started and then uh, we start helping them really build it piece by piece so all they need is just to provide us some basic data in our templates or just sit with us have a conversation just do some focus group discussions it takes us around a week week and a half to really understand their competencies their priorities their roles and then we feed it into our ai engine to start designing uh, role skill maps tests and assessments pathways and contents and so on and so forth so from there we start using and leveraging ai to do a lot of design work but organizations need a bit of homework to be done on roles and skills that they expect and what they expect the business to deliver okay so i foresee that one challenge that some organizations could have um cuz a common thing is a company might have you know maybe 40 100 different job titles and they all have job yeah. descriptions but those job descriptions might be quite old and they're outdated and yeah. uh you know so the skills the things that they have on there don't really correspond to what the people are actually expected to do so yeah. i could imagine that for some clients there's a bit of work to be done at the beginning where that stuff might need to be updated before you can even start doing these other steps is that right Yeah, that's right. So let me take an example of one of the Middle East-based oil company, and uh, without naming really anybody. So for these guys, uh, they already have a competency, and uh, we started by the same, and you know what their different roles expect, and so on and so forth. And we realized that this was built, I think, twelve years back for them. so and nobody has really updated that model and it doesn't hold any relevance because the new world that they are in it's way more agile way more chaotic and they need their people to really figure things out on their own be more resilient and therefore uh, what we did was we used our industry benchmarks and the role profiles that are already ready uh, which our ai is able to produce using a lot of crawling parsing and uh, integrations with databases like open skills onet which are big skill repositories being refreshed repurposed almost every day so we use all the data that's there in our data mine uh from there we help them understand how to really look at their competency model uh from the new world's perspective 
where are they headed really and what kind of competencies will make more sense we did a bit of calibration with their leaders and from there we took it ahead so yes you're right yeah, there are a lot of companies whose competency models are becoming outdated especially in the world that we are in and therefore we are finding a huge use case of ai to also uh, bring about that shift of skills that are important emerging skills versus the skills that are becoming redundant old outdated so we are also bringing together the skill repository with emerging versus outdated skills okay excellent um that's really great so really it sounds like the way ubrix works with the company whether it's let's say a big complicated healthcare organization that might have multiple hospitals people working in hundreds of different types of jobs um, or a small nonprofit that has, you know, at least a hundred people, you know, but, you know, kind of a smaller organization that might have less resources, less people that the way you work with them fundamentally is going to really be the same in either case. Like the process is, is pretty consistent. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay. And so when, um, one of the things, and maybe we can kind of uh, move into this, but uh, one of the things that really kind of blew me away when when talking with Brajat before was uh, he was showing me like once you get into this, you know, personalized pathway and it gives this task to someone and it says, okay, person, go do this thing. And then that person has to come back and provide feedback. They can't just say, I did it. They have to provide some feedback and you know, even to the point where, okay, well, what if you just give, you know, you're feeling lazy that day and you want to give very lazy feedback or basically nothing. Um, how does it deal with that? And so he's like, well, let's do it and did. And then the system gave him feedback on the feedback he gave, um, which I thought was really fantastic to even help course correct and say, all right, I see what you did there. How about, you know, considering it this way or asking some questions to, to prompt a little bit more, you know, specific feedback. Um, one of the other areas that uh, he and I had also talked about that I'd love to hear from you is, uh, you know, so as an employee, I could go in there, I get all these tasks I'm assigned to do. I could go and say, I did all of them. I did amazing at all of them. I'm perfect. Um, what sort of oversight happens from like my manager or HR to make sure that not only I'm actually doing that, but also that those tasks are actually relevant for me. And I'm not just trying to check boxes to kind of get it done so I can go back to work. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. That's, uh, that actually is the central piece for whole ROI conversation with our customers. So, um, uh, oversight needs to happen uh, at two levels. Uh, and before it goes to managers and HR, it has to come to us. So for us, it was very important to solve the problem uh, from platform uh, before we pass on the data to managers. So how we do that is exactly the, the incident that you narrated here, that when uh, an, a user is given a task and they give back their feedback, they're not feeling so good or they are lazy, they have not... Uh, really learned anything they're just doing it like a checkbox exercise uh, system will prompt them to give certain insights on what they learned what they did matches it to the company uh, it's at the role so if i'm a salesperson in an if i'm putting something i don't know maybe you know uh, effective uh, operational excellence or something like that it detects that it doesn't uh, really belong to my role. So I'm just writing some junk. I've copy pasted from somewhere. So it has its own ways and intelligence from AI to really read my script and my semantics to match it to the competency that I'm building on. So if I'm building on communication, the incident that I've written is related to communication or not. Is it related to the job that I'm in, whether it's a sales related incident or is it some random thing? And is it also related or relevant to connect 
uh, my learning right so is it like really some uh, something some more like you know copy paste from a website being written or is it really a real incident all these parameters are checked by our ai and we have created very strong engines at the back to do that so that's an assessment engine i would say which is a very small point in time assessment that happens immediately gives a user some score out of 10 and they are scored 3 on 10 4 on 10 if they have not done a good job of all these parameters and over a period of time it keeps giving them improvement recommendations as well that last time you know you failed on these one or two parameters or you could have done better and why not why don't we try this so it gives them it iterates and improves recommendations basis the comments that i put there and regularly administers say every two to three days administers a case study so for us we understand that case studies are the best way to elicit or understand uh, whether an individual or an employee will be able to solve a challenge in that will be thrown at them in their jobs so for us the main important thing is that they're able to solve those challenges effectively they understand them articulate them and therefore these case studies are again generated by ai for the context of jobs for the context of learnings that this learner is going through and it's created on the fly in the in the in the flow of their whole platform learning and pathway and therefore it keeps checking through multiple ways whether a person is improving or not once that validation check is over once our tool has tested this user for multiple times being able to improve their behavior now this data is consolidated as feedback and sent to manager that okay nikita is working on communication she is a great sales rep but she struggles with these two things and therefore uh, this is what my engine detects that despite all the recommendations she's not able to move forward on these areas and that's when manager feedbacks come in comes into the picture along with manager we also enable manager to really have those conversations how can they guide their team members and provide us regular feedback from there this data of ubric system and manager feedback is then combined and sent to hr if they need to take any other interventions like one of our clients realized that agility is not moving at the pace at which they want their uh, whole engineering team to move at and therefore they decided that along with self-paced online ai interventions we are also going to do one big session with our leaders and try to motivate uh, and create that kind of environment where everybody can see agility as an important priority. So that's the way three layered or, or, or I would rather say our layer and organizational layer governance works. So at this point, it can take all the context from organizational goals, the mission of the organization, the job titles, the competencies, all of this, it will correct, create on its own the specific tasks, assign those out to people, continuously learn as people come back, provide feedback on whether or not it was accurate, whether or not they were successful, and it will do all of this on its own, which yeah. then can you know, lead into things like performance management, succession planning, whether someone's ready for promotion or not. And so then um, at that point, you know, it's even creating performance, you know, like developmental goals for people essentially with these tasks. Um, what, what sorts of things does the manager really need to keep do at that point in terms of working with that person aside from just delegating them work? Um, because it seems like the system is basically kind of like doing everything else. It's telling them where they need to work on, how they're at with all that. It assesses them. It gives them feedback. It gives them feedback on their feedback. Um, so what? how does this change the role of the manager? Yeah. So uh, again, a very, very important call out. And we are uh, yet you know, trying to change that as a culture shift or uh, as a mindset shift for managers. Because managers, as you said, that you know, they, are, they are mostly uh thinking that they just give work delegated and that's it so it's a fundamental shift of managers starting to look at their talent from a more capability coaching perspective so for us uh what we do to uh, really empower and enable managers is that uh we help them right from day one 
to understand that this journey is incomplete and really ineffective if they are not playing an active role of being a coach being a motivator and being somebody who can bring industry and real on ground work context for their employees so we create monthly feedback and check in uh, mechanisms for managers to really first start acknowledging and understanding their team so the biggest gap that we discovered in our whole last 3 years working with managers is that uh, they don't they are not able to fix capability problem of their team because they don't understand beyond technical capabilities they just understand okay this person is not able to do work this person is lacking this technical skill but when it comes to really behavioral skills motivation levels uh, the competencies that make successful uh, employees professionals they don't really understand those finer behaviors so we have started educating them uh, giving them very precise data and inputs on these behaviors motivation levels and really also giving them guidance on how to react to it so if in their team is not collaborating really well what are the signals specific behaviors that are observable in the job and if they observe these behaviors how can they start fixing it so we are helping them in both ways we are making them more data intelligent when it comes to competencies and behaviors and we are also helping them become mentors or coaches by giving them specific guidance instruction and we've seen that if a manager is using these kind of tools and really interacting with their team regularly even say once in 2 to 3 months they start acquiring this muscle naturally they don't need like really ubrix instructions after a while they naturally start emerging into mentors and coaches so i would say that's the major fundamental shift that from performance manager they have to become mentors and coaches okay and so this also kind of raises some questions around uh what technology like this means for folks that do learning and organizational development work um yeah because many of the things you're describing uh, you know kind of in some way sound like they could easily take the place of someone who would be doing like let's say leadership development courses because the system can just assess for what skills i need and give me tasks and give me very specific feedback for each one of those very specific things that's identified for me and so do i need to still go to classes do i still need to do any of this sort of stuff that's been kind of the way that's been done for a lot of years uh so i'm curious looking kind of forward or even just now um how do you see technologies like this really changing the field of those of us who work in learning and organizational development yeah oh so that's very very empowering i would say so let me actually show you a slide so if we look at lnd od uh, or even od consultants right so it's a it's a huge a uh, pool of talent and people who are really working towards making lnd od uh, successful in organizations and we are trying to bring about the fundamental shift which i would say that i would rather quote verbatim comments from these people who are our end customers and and you know buyers that uh, it has really taken away the administrative hassle from their lives so uh, basically uh when they launch any of these journeys they can at max launch it for 20 people 50 people and for that they require so many different experts coming in providing constantly you know some kind of input guidance managing this journey timelines following up so on and so forth so the base level fundamental shift that platform is bringing to them is taking away a lot of administrative tasks uh which otherwise they would have done to send reminders to participants to tell them hey this is your report this is how you read it these are the instructions so all that coordination work is being taken away which means that they get much more time to do relevant things like create like right kind of content right kind of context right kind of sessions so they are able to work on more strategic outcomes that is one big shift that has happened second uh it's a very strong tool when it comes comes to giving them in best practices content that are ready to be deployed assessments that are ready to be deployed they can use something called as generative ai powered on authoring tool or content creation tool which is basically putting their thoughts into amazing multi format contents like videos 
quizzes, cases, articles in, in two minutes, and then they can refine it. They can add more context, more depth, more specificity to it. So it almost works like 60% is done, base level is created, and then they can top it much more depth of content. So that is very important. Second big task that AI can help them with. Uh, the third is insights and analytics. So I referred to this earlier in the conversation today that uh, we do a lot of stuff as OD, HR and LND professionals. We, we work a lot. We work very hard to make this, these programs successful. But where's the data? When business asks us that, okay, where's the data? What changed? Uh, how are people reacting on the ground? Can I just get, get all the data in one place, organized well, uh, everybody's voice? We struggle because, you know, we our data is sitting in many places. Sometimes we don't even have that data. It's very difficult to capture that data and capture users in the moment of their learning. Uh, we don't have access to our all users all the time. So all these challenges are being mitigated by AI by being a constant companion like an app to an employee. And that data is continuously flowing for OD teams, LND teams to make more adaptive, iterative changes to the programs and making it much more powerful, much more performance driven. So I would say that these are three most important changes that we are able to bring for them. Administrative uh, hassle being taken away, content being at 60% readiness and ROI data and taking them to Kirkpatrick level three and four, which is we drive performance and definitively uh, provide that insight to business. So they become business partners instead of being administrators, their role changes into business partnership. Okay. So when you say that business partner piece, can you speak maybe a little bit more on what does that look like? Because it sounds like this is able to account for a lot of things. And so the question is, so then what is that part that's essentially left over uh, for, for folks? Yeah, so uh, the business partnership role is more towards really discussing with every uh, business line what's changing. So I'll take an example of a large conglomerate that we are working with, where there are uh, approximately 58 different sub functions. It's a it's a global organization with diverse set of uh, you know businesses and sub functions and departments. So uh, when we implemented uh, Ubrix across this organization, uh, we real this this was around five thousand people. Uh, we realized that uh, they don't have our OD teams, LND teams don't have that data to tell every business what are their top trending skills, how is is the sentiment of their people, what is something that's derailing them from really contributing well. Uh, and, uh, you know, learning well in your organization and what are some of the uh, actions that they have taken? What are some of the big shifts that have happened in your business? Those kind of specific data points were not available and therefore it was never discussed with the business. But after, say, a quarter of implementation, all this data was given back to OD team. And they set up then one-on-ones with all the business leaders, approximately 25 one-on-ones were done. And uh, they discussed with them what are some of the talent challenges, talent uh, opportunities that are there in their businesses and how should they really plan their manpower, their skill building, their training initiatives. And that really got them a very good feedback from businesses and businesses started considering them as go-to entities for or go-to partners to really solve their scaling problems, to really solve their issues. So that's how it of a two-way bridge after shared with the business. And we started seeing a lot of business leaders coming to our presentations, to our reviews, to really understand how can they scale or utilize this better and drive it from top to bottom in their own uh, respective functions and businesses. Okay. Awesome. So then when we kind of look forward, you know, the skills that have been needed for people have, have kind of shifted and changed continuously, you know, because things are constantly changing. It mm -hmm. sounds like you're kind of leading towards or kind of speaking at 
what the future would look like, you know, in terms of like, if I'm a L and D professional today, what sort of things should I be thinking about to prepare myself for what that role might look like in five or 10 years as, you know, certainly Ubrix won't be the only one to incorporate AI for this. I know a lot of other companies are basically taking their existing products and just putting some AI component into it. Um, right. But like, what are those areas that you see? Like, what would you kind of recommend if, you know, if I'm a young you know, person wanting to get into this field, I'm, I'm new in this field, where should I be thinking to kind of prepare myself to really be effective and not get left behind? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a tricky one. So uh, because uh, we ourselves are figuring out so much, and there are so many opportunities. So you really have, <laughs> you really have thrown a question at me, which I'm still figuring out as a founder. But yeah, I can tell you one thing that uh, the future and the possibilities uh, for us, uh, as we see, uh, uh, as we see as an AI platform and the majority at which we are. Uh, to me, the biggest, uh, biggest opportunity would be that uh, we'll have a lot more uh, personalization and uh, specific data that will come our way. So, you know, uh, I, I believe that our, uh, as a learning professional, as an OD professional, are you able to look at the data that is important for you, right? So the biggest shift that any technology brings to an individual's life or, or an organization's life is that it gives you a lot of tools and arms and ammunitions, right? So that will be data. You'll get data on your skills. What are the good skills, bad skills, uh, useful skills, good roles, emerging roles, redundant roles. Uh, how are your people performing on the ground? What is their sentiment? You will get like tons and tons of data. And I think that's coming from really our own experience of looking at Ubrix and backend data. And it's enormous, the kind of insight we are getting, uh, or rather data that we are getting. But converting that data into insight and really feeding it back to business continuously uh, is a very challenging task because we have never seen this kind of data. So really makes making sense of it and converting it into business value is going to be a very big challenge. So I would say that that's going to be really the deal breaker or a maker for, for our future. That how now quickly we can iterate, use this data and really start adding value to business performance. Uh, to me, that's one very big very, very big uh, outcome that I'm seeing in the next one or two years. The second is that how do we, uh, we have all the technology, we have generative AI, it's growing at a very fast pace. So personalization is becoming more and more real. Now personalization is not going to be enough in next couple of years. Today, we talk about personalization. Earlier, we were, you know, if you see us a decade back, we were okay with generic things. We were okay with billboards. Now we need metrics you know specific custom or the shoes that we are looking at station has become a part of our lives now uh, it's a no-brainer it's just baseline expectation in the next couple of years it'll become experiential driven so to me i feel i just don't want you to give me what is relevant for me but what engages me what is fun for me what what i really like to do so now the challenge for ai or our professionals would be that when they are given all these tools again, how do they create right experiences for every individual? Is it simulation? Is it video? Is it real? I don't know. But yeah, those are some of the things that we are trying to answer that how do we now start taking the next leap of, uh, you know, uh, this whole data journey, which is experiential, uh, experiential activities and inputs given to employees every day. So to me, these are two big shifts. Okay, excellent. Um, now we've talked a lot about what Ubrix can do, all these different things. I'm kind of curious because we haven't really talked so much, I, I think, about what it can't do in terms of like what is the the limitations of its scope. Like, what would you say kind of fits outside of that? So as people are thinking, like, wow, it sounds like it can do so much. Bring us down just a little bit, uh, and yeah, just so what what kind of things fall outside of that? Yeah. So I think I would, uh, again, I would, as a founder, want to believe and think that we are able to do almost everything. But uh, uh, quite honestly, if I were to see uh, the landscape today, uh, 
tech and AI are yet to evolve and create a humanized touch uh, as much as, you know, we talk to Alexa or uh, any bot, we don't feel that we are talking to a human being. So, and in OD and LND field, uh, the impact and importance of human touch is still very high. And when we talk to employees, we always see that, you know, while they are from the new generation, they are, their world is virtual, literally. They, they live in their mobile phones more than in the outside world. Even then, any kind of interaction, any kind of uh, human touch really augments, amplifies the whole experience. And I believe that so far as technology, we are not ready to create that kind of personalized touch, personalized assurance, uh, that empathetic uh, conversation that can really amplify somebody's learning and uh, also regular. So I think that's where there is some distance. Uh, technology is making its way, but I do believe that we all need human coaches uh, at the end of it. At least one interaction, say, in few months is always uh, something that can accelerate our growth. Okay. I'm going to ask you one last question, then we're going to open it up for our Q&A portion here. Um, kind of keeping on this topic of like where there may be some limitations. So, you know, if we take a hospital, for instance, they would employ surgeons, um, you know, with something like Ubrix, where you have these different jobs that have, you know, like regulated education or certain things they need to do to maintain their, their certification to practice law or practice medicine or any number of things. I'm, I'm guessing that Ubrix wouldn't tell me like as a surgeon, okay, go perform this heart surgery or use this surgical technique and come back and give me feedback on it. So maybe if you could kind of talk about some of those things, um, you know, where maybe is the boundary on, on that? Uh, or maybe it does, maybe it will, if I'm someone who works in a very specialized regulated job, Maybe Ubrix is able to, to handle all yeah. of that. Yeah, so it does. Uh, uh, so my answer to that is it does and it doesn't. Uh, so for some functions, we are able to get some headway. Uh, when it comes to sales, for example, uh, that is more connected to their mobile, especially telecalling, not, not even not even sales. I would say that tel telecalling environments, telemarketing environments, where people are constantly connected to the telephony tools or they are you know they are always connected to some or the other system in those cases ubrix is able to reach out so we have recently started narrowing our whole proposition or solution uh, for one vertical uh, uh, very specifically so this is a new product line that we are coming up with which is uh, for salesforce effectiveness and especially for telecalling and tele marketing environments where people are constantly on calls we can analyze those calls in the real time and we can give them suggestions immediately after the call that hey this call went over all well the customer was excited or the sentiment was not too great these are some of the problem areas you didn't greet them well you didn't answer to their questions so we can give them specific competency related misses and hits warning signals in the call right real time in the in their flow and then we can tell them that next time next call when you're going on to these are two things that you have to do you have to start with a greeting you have to tell them about yourself before you dive into business so these are some of the things that we're able to draw or drive real time for people uh, in environments which are more uh, uh, which are more virtual which are more telephonic or uh, or computer based but when it comes to surgeons they are still on the field they're still in the physical world physical environment so that's where the limitation of our app or of technology is that we cannot be monitoring, looking at, reviewing, or even, you know, giving them feedback basis what they are doing on the field so far. So that's the limitation that I would say. And uh, we are yet to cross that bridge, really don't have an answer for that. Okay, sure. Yeah, we certainly can't expect to uh, have to have answers to everything and, and be able, you know, but um, no, this has been fantastic. So at this point, we'll go ahead and open it for any questions that uh, folks may have. Uh, uh, so I'm not sure. I know we had a couple who, who needed to drop off time zones and such, um, but I'm, I'm sure we've, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure I can count on Jonathan to have at least 
a half a dozen questions. Uh, he's, he's a very curious person. Jonathan's been uh, helping us lead the effort on doing a lot of stuff related to AI this year and last year. And um, so, yeah, but uh, fire, fire away, Jonathan. I, I know you've got probably uh, plenty there and that's, that's exactly what we want to do. Oh, your audio is very quiet. I don't know. If... Um, how's that? Oh, there you go. Much yeah. better. <laughs> this yes. is a highly directional microphone. I count on it for that and then forget. So uh, I appreciate all the effort you put into um, creating the, the common ground for this talk and asking some really interesting questions. I was going to send you a couple in text, but um, you uh, the conversation ended up going forward in those directions anyway. So when I saw the slides just now, I don't know about other people, maybe um, uh, it's because right now I'm on my laptop. Uh, I could I could barely read it, the just the headlines in each in, in each uh, sub slide. So but from what I could see, the competencies were extraordinarily general, like communication or you know that kind of thing uh, which is a massive field made up of hundreds of competencies so um is is the ai that ubrix is using focused at that generic level um yeah. but then when it sees somebody taking action then it now narrows down to what they were doing and what their goals are or does the AI have a conversation with people or is this in the works using the upcoming, you, you know, the API for uh, Microsoft um, OpenAI GPT-4.0 uh, to have before each call as a trainer would have or a manager would have a, a goal setting discussion with the person who's about to be on the call or an orientation discussion at least where the person about to make the call says, you know, here's here's where we left off with this person or this person's a totally new contact or whatever. And here, you know, here's what I know about them and they're what I intend to achieve with them that I think is achievable in this call. Um, is there going to be that kind of dialogue or has Ubrix AI not got there yet? Yeah, so Jonathan, I'll answer that question in two parts. When it comes to, uh, and thank you, that's that's very interesting, uh, I would say, as a perspective as well, because this that's a problem that still is work in progress to, for us to solve. So, uh, but we have done something to really uh, start our way there. So first is that um, uh, first part of the issue where we try to map a role, ideal role profile. So that we get from all the data from organization. And then uh, basis that ideal role profile, we really conduct assessments first. So we try to understand what are the gaps of an individual. And that's where once a report is out, we have a check-in point. So at that point, managers have to discuss this with their team member individually and really understand what are the goals that they need to prioritize, what are some of the areas that they would like to work on. And then they mutually decide that, you know, my plan would be six months, eight months, 12 months, and so on and so forth. But we tell them that if you work on this for six months, this is where you're going to reach. You're going to basically be 70% role ready. If you work for 12 months, you'll be 80% role ready. This is very important as a buy-in process for us, but it's Sorry, still- I'm, I'm a little lost. 80% of what? 80% of your role fitment. So for example, your role requires you to be proficient in uh, 10 competencies and you go in say around I don't know maybe four so you have six competencies to really cover up for so then you can decide that hey I would like to pick up two first first I'll just pick up top two problem areas I'm going to work on them for next five months and then I'm going to see if I want to really extend this plan so that makes you 50 percent or 60 percent ready after you have added those two to your whole bouquet so that's how we just help them understand that the more number of competencies you're building, the better your skill profile is, the more fitter you are for the role. And that could be also for your next role, which is for your promotion. But that decision we leave on managers and users to decide a lot of times. 
and in some cases just to ensure that scale is achieved for example you know what if we have we have 5000 people now we don't expect that all 5000 people would be doing those conversations so a lot of times uh, we have seen that hr from an organization takes that override and it just creates those individual development plans based as the reports so that's we that's how we are trying to sort of yes. what do you mean an override sorry yeah an override so basically you know, if managers and users have, or employees have not decided their uh, development areas within a stipulated time, then as per the report, whichever two problem areas are coming out to be the most difficult ones, most problematic ones, they just pick that up. To what extent could um, uh, Ubrix AI shift gears to helping people build on their strengths as opposed to uh, just shoring up weaknesses? Yeah, so uh, we have right now focused a lot on development areas. For strengths, we just give them a bit of input and insight that in your report, say agility is your strength. And we try to remind them of that strength in some actionables, but very uh, sparingly, I would say. So maybe once or a couple of times in a month, we may remind them but some organizations take that call uh, because we are a module or a or an or competency based system which picks up competence one competency and then you know start building on it so if some com companies decide that we want to take a strength based approach so we don't want our people to really work on the development areas immediately we want to shift gears the system is quite technically it's quite ready so it just picks up another competency which is agility and it's your strength and it starts reinforcing that in your lives. But primarily, we are wired to build development areas and not really by default strengths. Um, have you shown us, sorry, I, I wasn't able to make it for the first bit. Uh, as I mentioned to Tony, I have this uh, uh, important thing to deliver to my, my boss to prepare me for a meeting tomorrow at 6.30 in the morning. Um, the have we seen something of behind the scenes or under the hood to understand what you are referring to like how does how does ubrix ai work to gather the data uh so we have done a bit of you know just like a few slides and we have kept a few demos ready but yeah we we have been just talking for last one hour so really haven't got a chance to show you guys the backdrop or the product really. But yeah, but but so far we have just discussed broad steps and broad capabilities. This uh -huh. might be a good time, Nikita, if you wanted, since you mentioned having some demos ready, if you want to maybe pull something up and, and demonstrate. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, all right, I can do that. So if that's what you guys want right now, yes. And I have a technical question. Um, are other people experiencing Nikita's voice and face freezing from time to time? And then we miss half a word or a full word? Occasionally. Or a few words? Yeah. Okay, so I don't know, is there a solution to that? Like, should we, we say, you know, it's choppy and then you repeat a few words? Yes, I think that's that's good. Thank you for saying that, Jonathan. It's choppy for me as well. Uh, so, yes. You could, you could also turn off the camera and probably not have that problem. Yeah, that's a good idea, Owen. <laughs> Thank Let's you. see, yeah. Is that better? Well, we'll find out in a minute. It, it doesn't happen that often. It happens like every two yeah, or three minutes. Awesome. Yeah, it's choppy for me. Uh, so yeah, okay, cool. All right, so we can, uh, so Tony, are we done with rest of the agenda? So maybe we can spend, we have 10 minutes left. So maybe we can spend say around five to seven minutes in the demo. Sure, yeah. And then, yeah, our plan was once we kind of wrapped up and I mean, since we have such a, a small group, we can, we have some flexibility, but we're going to like maybe take a break for a few minutes, 
and then kind of come back for the after hours portion. And uh, yeah, Nikita's already agreed to, to stay on extra. And yeah, we have, uh, since Jonathan, I know you, you mentioned came in a little bit after, uh, so Rajat's on their sales team and, and Maxim is their chief technology officer. So if you have, you know, some of those other technical questions you might have, depending on how far you want to go, uh, they've, they've brought backup of people who are more than capable of speaking to some of those uh, questions for you, I imagine, there. But yeah, Nikita, feel free, anything you'd like to share. Yeah, I think uh, I would just give a quick demo of the product, perhaps, uh, and would love to hear thoughts from the group. Just give me a second. Are you all able to see my screen now back? Yes. Okay, awesome. So uh, I'm going to do a quick setup uh, here. I'll pick up any role, uh, which could be say a sales manager. Maybe. Uh, can you give me an industry? Any industry is okay, but if you can just give me any industry. Healthcare. Okay. Or Rachel, would you want to choose a different industry? Uh, no, I think this works. Okay. Cool. So first step, uh, we because of our integrations with different skill repositories, we have created a demo instance where uh, sales manager, uh, broad responsibilities, uh, and you know some of the things that they're supposed to do like sales strategies, revenues, uh, relationship with clients, competitor activities, all these are being fetched. And then some of the recommended skills have come here, which is business acumen, decision making, results, communication, building relationships, negotiation. Generally, our clients would have a set of skills with them, but for ideal uh, job profile, say a sales manager in healthcare, but if they don't, then for a small company, which doesn't have really that kind of resource to put all this together, we can give them these recommendations using AI. And if they want to add something, edit it, add some more capability to it, whether, whether it's managing conflict, creativity, uh, delegation, nurturing talent, they can do that. So this is your competency profile ready and we're good to go from here. I'm going to show you uh, a learner instance. Learner has to uh, is given login profile on their emails. We can integrate it with um, email IDs, you, nons, mobile. Print. Sorry, yeah. You were so choppy. Could you repeat that? Yeah. Okay. So uh, we basically uh, uh, give various uh, inputs to the learner in form of uh, login credentials could be on their mobile, could be on their emails, uh, or it could be a single sign on. So they put their credentials and they log into the system. So this is learner portal and a learner, say Rahul, who is a sales manager in healthcare has been set up in the system. Now, uh, the success profile or the ideal role profile, what a company expects of you is being shown here. We have different proficiency levels. So it could be a middle level, level three, it could be a senior level role. So we have different types of combinations and combinations and the person or the learner is able to see what's expected of them. So this is more like baseline and defining uh, what is that your role or competency fit uh, requires you to do. And from there, uh, the second step initiates, which is assessments. So we have different uh, repositories of uh, uh, assessments. Usually our clients validate this before the launch happens. So we give them personality tests, case-based scenarios, product knowledge, uh, AI role play, simulation, so on and so forth. So there are a lot of tools that are already there. This is 
can be, they are configured on role profile. So the questions that they are going to get for cases uh, will be related to that role and the competencies that are important or relevant for that role. The person has to respond. These are some samples that I've put here for demo. So the person has to respond to these tools and uh, companies can also pick up and upload their own tools in the system. So once all this is administered, there are role plays. So AI bot can talk to a person and understand their competencies in a real role play environment as well. So these kind of different tests are administered and there's a consolidated report that comes out. Now this report helps this person understand what is that percentage fitment that Jonathan and I was talking about, that if I have 70% fitment because out of 10 competencies expected of me, I'm good in seven or I meet expectations on seven, then I have three problem areas or say one or two development areas that I have to work on. So it gives me like my whole profile as a learner that what are my strengths and what are my development areas. It also helps me understand it in a more visually appealing way, which is very simple to understand because we don't want our learners to be really struggling with data understanding and knowing more about their profile. We help them understand uh, every competency and we tell them like a position point pointer and we tell them where they should be so what is their current level what is their expected level is something that we help them understand we also can administer personality tests for them which are based on big five models and we can map their different personality traits that influence these behaviors in their lives so uh, so far am i clear before i move to the next part big five related to what so uh, personality traits, which are basically from the big five personality model, we can but, also administer that. But you were showing things that are unrelated to the big five. I'm, I'm... Oh, just a second. This one, right? So uh, this is a base model on Big Five, uh, which is being broken down into 16 characteristics. And therefore we are looking at overall uh, personality assessment, which is much more finer and detailed. And therefore you see Big Five being broken down into various sub factors here to help an individual understand their personality more in depth. Nikita, on. Um... Uh, for this, there are a lot of organizations that use different assessments to assess personality. One example being the Hogan assessment. Is it possible for to uh, integrate something like that as well, or is it or is it statically using Big Five? No, it is it is possible to integrate. In fact, uh, a lot of our uh, uh, clients are using different tools for different segments of their employees as well. So for senior leaders, they must be using Hogan. For the junior people, they must be using some other tool. So yes, if they want to use this tool, that's great. If they don't want to and they want to upload their data, that's possible. And Nikita, kind of along that same line with the competencies, uh, you know, part of your background is working with Corn Ferry, you know, organizations that use a Corn Ferry model of competencies. I'm, I'm guessing that that could easily be integrated in with this as well, pretty seamlessly. Yes, absolutely. So all these competencies can easily be uh, edited, updated, or uh, aligned to the frameworks that companies are using, whether they're using Conferi or they're using their own model. Yeah. Yeah, should we move forward? When you went through Sorry, when you went through the the thing before where you were clicking things and moving really fast, it was impossible to read what you were clicking. Can you mm -hmm. show that for a moment? Uh, the tests. I, I couldn't tell whether it was a test or some self rating or something. Yeah, so there are different types of tests here. Um, I can this is completed. I can show you something else. Yeah, so you can see this. These are some of the statements that are there for personality assessment. And oh, okay. anyway, after, after this 
uh, demo, I can send you some login instances where our full test is there because these are more samples, right? So this is just four questions. We have um, 60 questions in our actual tool. All right, I, I've got the basic idea on, on these. Can you show mm -hmm. us something more um, competency-based? Sure, so uh, right now uh, I have already completed this test. So I'll have reset the whole instance, but yeah, there are cases that are there in that a person responds to. So scenarios are given to them related to competency that, you know, your people in the team are fighting with each other and there is a crisis situation. What are you going to do? And then some options are given to them in form of situational judgment tests. Got it. Uh, all right. So now I'm going to show you that after assessments are done, there is an IDP uh, or individual development plan uh, drop down that's created in the system. So for my problem areas, I have this step where I can discuss this with my manager and can uh, choose areas that I want to work on and create my development plan. So now communication has been added to my development journey and so on and so forth. I can keep adding more areas here. I can pick up building relationships. I can add that. So I can decide the sequence of my de development areas. I can also decide which areas I want to work on. And it tells me the timelines for completion and for uh, really, uh, you know, working on my competencies to become better fit of my role. So currently I'm at 70% role fitment. But if I have to reach 90%, I have to work on these two areas and so on and so forth. So that's how uh, my whole development plan is aligned to my role readiness and role fitment. And it creates direct impact on my outputs and performance. So my module structures are, uh, if you look at Ubrix as the uh, whole platform where we're trying to drive on ground actions, our module structures are designed in a way where companies can integrate with their own content. But after contents are done, they have to get into activity phase. So here we get, get them nudges and actions. And for every competency, every level, every role, there will be precise suggestions that will be created. This is more for demo purpose. So you're seeing a lot of content here, but respond, responsive to a learner's activity, their role, uh, their pace, these cards and inputs keep uh, changing and they keep uh, becoming more and more sharper. As Jonathan, you asked that, right? Is it like more reactive or is it first you plan and then you keep adjusting? So we generally plan an area and then as per learner's response, recommendations keep coming to them uh, as per their manager's feedback or case study analysis. So here, let's take an example. Uh, the recommendation is that for effective communication, maybe I have to keep it simple. I have to take the right pauses. I have to use less words. So uh, this is what this card is trying to help a learner understand and then it also tells them how is it applicable for a healthcare sales manager. So I had put this uh, industry and the role right now when I started this demo and it has started creating inst incidents already from its basic understanding of the role, basic understanding of the level of, of industry. And it has told me that, okay, if you want to keep your communication simple, where all can you use it? Whether with healthcare providers, whether in conferences, contract negotiations, sales strategies, product demos. So it has told me multiple ways in which in healthcare as a sales manager, I can simplify my communication. And these are some of the incidents which I would apply in my life. Now it has created a short example for me. So during my meeting, so how would I apply this, right? I still have a question that, okay, you've given me a recommendation. I'll try it in my uh, meeting with my healthcare provider, but I still don't know how that conversation will pan out. So additionally, uh, generated example. So, uh, you know, uh, there is a case where Dr. Patel uh, and Dr. Nguyen are meeting and here, after every two sentences, this guy paused, allowed doctors to process the information. So uh, basically here you see the power of AI really coming alive. Uh, and this is what our customers really love. 
that for every recommendation or a content bite, we are able to add loads and loads of context, even from day one, even from absolutely no information apart from their role, broad description and industry. So that's where we have connected all these systems to bring these contexts and examples for every learner for the activities and contents that they are consuming. So, yeah, yeah. So is this generatively created on the fly so that if we had come back to this uh, 10 minutes later, it would give a different scenario? Yeah, yeah. If you come back in 30 seconds, also it'll give you a different scenario. I'll just do it again. So if somebody wanted to get back to the scenario they saw before, do they have that option? Yeah, they can save it. Uh, in, our, uh, in our actual journeys, they are able to save some of these examples and keep them as a reference in their reflection journals. And then... uh, where, where would they click to save it? So there is a button which is not there in our demo, but usually there's a reflection journal button and if they click on it, it gets saved in their reflection journal. And then I know Rachel had a question she put in the chat, um, but I know you've been talking quite a bit about competencies and, and capabilities. But I just want to see, Rachel, do you feel like your question got answered or did you? Yeah, I think now that seeing seeing it in the system, it makes sense. Um, I think my my question was also understanding because I like how you're carrying every connecting through all of these competencies and capabilities. Um, because it called out specifically on your website, the new atomic unit of work, I was wondering if there was a bigger meeting to capabilities and, you know, for example, is this, are you proposing that it's you being used in things like workforce planning or workforce strategy? So just wanted to understand the new atomic unit of work. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that is answered. Otherwise, definitely would be happy to give you more clarity. Yeah. I mean, on top of the way it's used in the system right now, uh, is there anything that we haven't seen in terms of how you're thinking about that integrating? Sorry, yeah, you were choppy, Rachel, I'm so sorry. Yeah, is there, uh, besides what we've seen on this topic in the, in the system thus far, is there mm -hmm. anything about capabilities uh, as an atomic unit of work that we haven't seen yet in terms of how, how they're used and, and the advantages that organizations would get by using this. Yes, yes, you have. So yeah, it's a, it's a fairly exhaustive system. So yes, we haven't really gone even 30% in the demo yet. Uh, Tony can back that up for <laughs> sure. <laughs> you know, Nikita, on the, I think it was the previous screen, uh, mm -hmm. there was, a button on the left hand side in the menu that said mood like mood meter and um i was wondering if you could kind of speak to that because when you're getting to talking about the assessments um mm -hmm. you know it would seem natural that one of the things that could also be indicated or included is like an employee engagement assessment and then with the mood meter people can uh, Tony, i'm sorry here. huh yeah uh, i I think I lost you again in between. Are you oh, I'm so bit... sorry. Uh, no, no. Yeah. But yeah, it would seem that in the assessments that there could be one for employee engagement. And then with the, all the feedback that people are giving after they complete these tasks, that, that also gives indication as to how people feel. You know, do mm -hmm. they feel frustrated with their work? You know, I really have a hard time working with this person or... I, I hate this project or I, I love my team. My manager is really great. Uh, and yeah. so what sort of other sentiment data and engagement data is this also capturing and, and what's being done with that? Yeah, yeah. So what um, I'll, I'll try to show you the dashboards as well. Uh, let me just quickly complete this, uh, this flow. Tony, that you mentioned earlier on the call that once this action is done, how do we know whether this is checked in the box? is basically with adding some experience. So for example, I'm checking the box. I, I have not done anything about it. So it starts analyzing my response and it has, uh, it has capability to process uh, all the text, all the unstructured inputs, even in different languages. We have 39 languages. 
so they can put it in spanish and they can get those results as well out where it evaluates them real time and because my score was low my 70% has not moved up so i have to regularly respond to these reflections i have to answer the questions i have to respond to some case studies now these case studies are also created on the fly and when i respond well to these questions and cases only then my skill score starts moving so if say these are the quizzes and everything is like related to healthcare company as you can see for sales manager so all these things are created by generative ai so for example i don't know to retain listening uh, promising okay i'm just reading this so for example i say this this is right and this has increased my scores so now i've become 71% so for every activity where i'm doing right things it's marginally increasing my my skill scores and my updates are going to the managers and that's how regularly this system keeps wiring me into uh, better more sharper recommendations and things that i'm struggling with it keeps bringing that back for a reminder uh, so that is one part and there is an ai mentor bot again that works in various languages whether it's <clears throat> french spanish various languages it can work in and you can ask any work related questions it's not a chat bot it's a generative ai powered coach bot which really helps them answer questions to their problems uh, uh, in their real life, in, related to their role, related to their industry. So I'll do this. Then I, if we, if time will permit, I can come back. But just to show you the dashboard that Tony was talking about, um, we do the breakdown of a journey by completion stats, which can be, of course, broken down by people's departments, their roles, their locations, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> Uh, it also helps us understand the sentiment breakdowns, uh, which can then give us much more deeper data. I'll, I'll show that as well. But every module, every competency, which are our top competencies that are being picked up, which are the least picked up. So here, org mind, one org mindset has not been picked up really well. So that is a competency where we have to do some work. Uh, what has been our skill score breakdown? So on and so forth. So these kind of insights can we can create a program report card, how many people have moved forward, how many people have not moved forward and who are in our reds, yellows and green. And sentiment data tells us top problems. So here, if there is low sentiment, why is it low? In which pockets of the organization, a particular factor like workload or planning multiple tasks is a problem. And then this data is sent to HR and managers to really change a few things which could be culture which could be the way they are delegating work the guidance that they are providing to their teams the empowerment to try new ideas so there could be multiple factors where people are frustrated and the sentiment is low and these are corrective actions that are suggested to managers and uh, and hr for taking the right decisions on engagement as well erwin i know you've been Kind of quiet. I know you've also been doing some stuff with AI as well. I'm just kind of curious if you have any any questions that you want to throw out as well. Well, it's certainly uh, a broad and interesting implementation of a lot of things you can see in separate tools that are out there. Um, I I think the the big the big question for me is. Um, the degree to which this methodology adopted in many situations is going to make work feel like it's micromanaged, even though it's <laughs> even though it's developmental feedback, yeah. it's 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 flexible, it's valuable, it's you know it's useful information and all that. It's like I think a, re a normal human response to this would be leave me alone, <laughs> right? So, so I think that that's an issue for this kind of um, methodology. Uh, you know, a, as it was going on, I had two thoughts. I don't know if you're familiar with the old uh, American TV show, I Love Lucy, where she's uh, putting um, chocolate on certain numbers of uh, chocolate that's rolling down an assembly line. <laughs> 
and uh, and the, at the better she gets, the faster the machine goes. And so that's one image. And the other image was from the old movie Metropolis, where there's, it's just dehumanizing activity, even though it's very user friendly dehumanizing activity. So that that's for the time we have. That's that would be an issue. I'd like to hear your thoughts on. So I uh, think that you are, to some extent, I would say that, yes, the way you administer or the You're dropping I'm off now. Think? Sorry. You dropped off completely. Hello? Hello? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's very interesting. Can you hear, can you guys hear me now? Is it now? Better? Yes. Perfect. All right. So, yeah, I think that's a very interesting and important call out. Uh, and I do believe that anything that becomes, you know, highly monitoring and, uh, you know, reporting that creates that kind of impression. So there has to be a fair balance. And in our implementations, that's what we try to do. Uh, there are two things that are important in this whole implementation. First is that uh, we're trying to provide support to people. Uh, or, or coaching advice to people who, who are not able to get that advice very often and they are feeling lost. So it has to have organic pull from the user and that's what we rely on. We don't really push them or force them or report their you know, scores to everybody. We try to understand in their persona and coach bot really prompts them to ask questions to really share their problems. And if really you know what kind of uh, issues uh, that are coming out in their assessment reports are those things that they are struggling with so for us the buying of a user is extremely important of an employee and that's where we focus a lot on bringing organic uh, input organic traction into the platform second it's very important to keep it engaging as well so uh, you know it's more about having fun with it trying, experimenting. So the first thing in our design philosophy or implementation plan is that, hey, are you open for your employees to really try, test out things, really fail, fail multiple times, do new things, right? So if organizations are reluctant to that uh, philosophy, uh, we generally don't go ahead because in this, as you could see, right, there were so many nuggets, so many actions that were given to people. And they all will sometimes fail and sometimes succeed. And it's an iterative process of improvement of competency. So we are trying to give them multiple inputs not to be on their back, but very scientifically, we have understood that if every day you try to focus on the competency that you're not very good at or is in development area for you, and you just do one thing about it cautiously in your brain, you start building that muscle. It's like our gym workout, right? It's just like, you know, every day I go for a 10 minute walk and my body remains in good order. So I think that's the whole philosophy that we are trying to drive uh, and manager involvement. Uh, the data that is sent to them is being very carefully curated. We don't send them all the stats. We try to help HR take right decisions and managers be coaches. So just help them understand if an employee needs their help, really needs that support, only then it should be uh, really related to the manager. So that's how we are solving this. And I do agree that it should not be a reporting performance management system, which feels like, hey, you're on my back, but it should be more organic that, hey, you're my coach, so you're there. And some of the user stories I'm going to send to you guys after this call, where people record, uh, people have given us some recordings that, you know, uh, I'm struggling. It's very embarrassing to ask my peers. They will judge me, my managers. And I just go to Ubrix AI bot and I ask that, how do I handle this customer? They are just giving me very tough time. They're bullying me. So those kind of questions, who do you ask? You don't have a buddy around. So we are trying to create a buddy. <laughs> so, yeah. So that's, well, that's well, you know, the, the other comment I would add, though, I've worked in very large organizations and less large organizations. And the one mm -hmm. thing in common in both, regardless of the size of the organization, is people, when they know they're being observed, they yeah. can game the system to make themselves look as good or poor as they want them to do. And, right. and so, you know, you're... 
I think that's a, that sentiment data, for example, if you know that expressing negative sentiments is not going to be well received because it makes a manager look bad, guess what yeah. you're probably not going to do unless you, um, you know, are very brave. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that is, that is the most, in fact, Irvin, you know, thank you for saying that because that's the most sensitive piece of the whole platform, right? So learning, and uh, uh, even, you know, uh, when we look at daily actions, that's more, I would say, an activity fun for people. Sentiment data, how we treat it, we continuously send those disclaimers that this is not being shared in individual capacity for any individual with anybody. And we ensure that even organizations ask us, right? So a lot of times our sales is dependent on the fact that, hey, can you guys share this data because we want to really retain our talent or we have like thousands of reasons why we need this data but we are extremely extremely diligent and very clear that we're not going to take the deal which where we have to really send this in the individual data to anybody so sentiment data is completely anonymized it's for us to gauge moods of people and you cannot pin it to any individual it's more about detecting uh, larger function level culture issues and not for individual specific issues. Yeah, that's not the best outcome for organizations, but that's all we can do as Ubrix. When, when you were introducing your system, you actually talked about some other potential uses of the, of the capability that uh, Ubrix has, which were much more interesting to me, such as um, if you're if you're uh, doing a new project in the organization and you need to find difficult to find skill people, but there's an organizational work management system that has a record of who worked on different kinds of things. Like that person was around when that old valve was created. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, it could pull through the data and say that person is still with the organization. You might want to get them on your team because they have insights that the modern people don't understand because they build different kinds of valves today. So I think there's a lot of those kinds of capabilities. For example, when you dig into the organization and you find that old expert on valves, they may not know a lot of the changes that have made, been made to technology of valves. And so to the degree that the system could coach the, 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 the person you found that was critical back in the old days uh, and make them more critical and relevant in the new days, that would be a valuable thing for a lot of companies. Yeah, that's that's incredible. You know, there is so much, It's especially you know, in industries where... Uh, attrition is very high you also end up you know losing your old timers very fast so you need to utilize who all are there who have that wisdom much more effectively so i think uh, and new people are joining every day you know or, or a company is growing very fast so i think these two use cases uh, we can definitely propose that how do you leverage people who have some core capabilities and they can be really transmitted faster as we uh, uh, as we kind of get towards the the end little bit here, uh, I just want to be respectful of time, especially for our, our guests that are joining us from literally halfway around the world. Um, I I would like to open it up if you know either Maxim or Rashad has anything they might like to share as well. Of course, I mean Nikita's been you know uh, using her voice quite a bit the last couple of hours and and so kind to answer all the questions and show us stuff, but. Uh, you know, we have Maxim, their chief technology officer, and Rajat here as well. Um, so I, I don't know if either of you have anything you'd like to contribute or share, but we'd love to hear from you if you'd like to. So, uh, I think Nikita has covered almost everything, and um, I guess the Q&A was very informative and learning for me as well. So I have nothing to add on that um, uh, specifically. But just happy to get these responses and these feedbacks. Uh, it's very important. We're going to be, I think, back at it again, uh, brainstorming as well, the ideas that we've got. So this has been very helpful as well, Tony. Thank right. you, Jonathan. Thank you, Irvin. Thank you, Rachel. As well. Thank you. I do have one question. What is a UBRIX uh, acronym for something? It is basically, Irvin, uh, you know, it's a, it's a function of... Uh, 
something that we core believe that excellence can be a process can it we are not necessarily born with excellence we can build it like a rubric so we have called it u bricks e plus rubric and we have created an s because that just gives us a better way to pronounce it but yeah excellence the rubric has a merit and good to everyone so yes Thank that's you. our mission excellent uh, Maxim, did you have anything you wanted to share in our, our last couple of minutes here? Oh, you're on mute. Oh, oh sorry, Tony. So I just wanted to answer one uh, one question that was brought up in terms of uh, how does it uh, fit into the culture of the organization and how it should not come across as micromanagement, right? So uh, the way we have built this technology and the way we have built the communication around it is we as a system facilitate any kind of uh, mode that the that the client wants. So and how the tone is set for the company and by the leaders for, uh, forms a very important part of how people look at it. So uh, during our onboarding procedure, we do encourage the leaders of the company to come and express right what do they think about your bricks and what do they want the employees of their company to uh, uh, to achieve from your bricks. Right, so there are uh, a good portion of our P, uh, of our clients who like to drive a very uh, open um, uh, culture where they want to keep it very democratic. Uh, they want people to make their own choices. Right, they allow people whether they want to do it or not. And some are more authoritarian where they really want certain uh, teams in the company to actually do it, and they really like to enforce it. So we as a platform don't try to enforce any culture on people. We leave it to the leaders of the organization. And our system is well equipped, uh, even in terms of the communications that go out, the involvement of managers. Like you can very well turn off uh, the involvement of managers completely. So the managers won't even get a single update on what's happening with the people and uh, what they're doing, uh, their skill scores, nothing at all becomes visible, right? So those kind of culture enablers are something that our uh, system is well equipped to handle. And that way it becomes an organic pull for people. And you would see your bricks uh, running on the ground very differently for an organization which is more, uh, which is having a, a, a micromanaging culture versus something which is uh, more democratic. So that is something that a system is well equipped to uh, well equipped to handle. And one of the things I, I remember in my conversation with uh, Rajat that I found really interesting. Oh, shoot. Was that, did I freeze that time? Okay. Uh, but was the because you were talking about culture, Maxim, that if as a company you say, we want a culture where people can be a bit more direct and you know, not as, as you know, gentle or kind, you know, soft in communication, that you can tell the system that you want it to be that way. If that's a, an important part of your culture, or if you want something that is much more soft or you know, your population is much younger. Uh, or, you know, different demographics that you can have the communication kind of reflect the culture of the people and what you want in a very intentional way. I thought that was that was really neat. Uh, but Jonathan, I see you have like one last thing here is, yeah. You said that you wanted oh. When you said that you wanted some uh, uh, words of wisdom from Rajat and Maxim, I had been holding for about five minutes at that point that I wanted to hear from Rajat and Maxim a very different perspective, and that is this, really from Nikita too. What have you used rubrics for, for your own personal development? So I can start, cool. maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 of course. No, no, Maxim, I think you should go. You have an interesting story also around navigating ambiguity. So why not? Yeah. Uh, so, so we have been constantly uh, working on our own development journeys on Ubrix ourselves, right? So I've been working on uh, navigating ambiguity, uh, which for us in our environment and for the product that we're doing uh, ex exactly for this uh, scenario, right? We have realized that for every client that uh, we release Ubrix, uh, it materializes very differently. So it's it's like uh, there's no uh, glove that fits every enterprise's hand. So every enterprise uses it very differently. So we we usually have a lot of ambiguity in use cases, right? So being able to uh, understand this ambiguity from a different culture lens, from a different implementation lens, and being able to process this all together into a centralized product 
which is able to give that which has that balance of uh, not being too complex to configure but at the same time being having that flexibility to adjust to every client's requirement is was quite a big challenge right so uh, i was able to see for myself uh, despite having uh, being uh, well versed with the system the suggestions that came to me the way it helped me shape up and think differently for each client how it gave me examples how it made me practice was a very big uh, very big learning for me i would have loved to tell you more but i'll uh, in the interest of time i'll just keep it short but it has really helped me myself become a better leader and uh, build the product better which which is uh, which is like a feedback loop for in itself can you tell us in the that we saw pieces of of the ubrix system um what did you find most useful for you in learning how to navigate ambiguity yeah so what uh, i found the most um, useful for me was uh, the action cards that come out so what the action card uh, gives you is a very short um, um very short advice which on the surface might seem like okay this is something that i really know uh, but when it forces you to apply it to a situation it challenges you to think and that is the first part of the equation so what then happens is when uh, you actually go and apply it you see that some some of the things work and a lot of times uh, what you try to apply doesn't really work so when it completes as a feedback loop with another suggestion of okay so i told this uh, for example i was trying to deal with a certain ambiguous situation with one of my direct reports and when i spoke to that person i assume that this technique would probably i i um, uh, planned that this is how it would work out well but it did not work out as well as it expected right so when i put that reaction that this is how the person reacted and that's not what i expected it actually gave me another insight which helped me understand that oh i missed this i did not have the foresight to see this right and now it was and this was probably more than a year ago and till date i remember it and i still make sure that i don't repeat that mistake again do you have screenshots from that that story is so interesting because you're at a relatively high level and some of the things that have been talked about like Nikita when you were going through the the early parts of of what I saw it was so generalized it was almost hard to impossible to follow um and what what your and I was thinking this must be for very frontline people um so to hear that it is useful for somebody at you know with with a, a bigger purview in an organization that is very interesting yeah all right here here's a slogan for you this is performance development in the flow of work oh yeah wow. yeah incredible power. all right i'm going to go ahead and stop the recording